earth but also of hell and we realize in studying that why there is a hell because he's the creator of it and and there was a purpose for it all but anyhow we we finished that and I do want to go on to I want to talk about next uh, something that relates I think closely to knowing God and, and the person of God and that is has to do with the free will of man and uh, the contrast to that is what uh, uh, the church history has called Calvinism and we're going to be looking at what is Calvinism and, and how that does not portray the character of God uh, and, and that'll be in the weeks to come but knowing that this was going to be the fourth I was between the two messages uh, I just want to do a, a message today that a little bit more God and country type of message uh, on, the, on the subject of liberty and uh, we're studying an overview of, of Galatians on Wednesday now and my mind was fresh on Galatians and out of all the passages I could have picked that Galatians just put it all together for me so if you look at Galatians chapter 4 let me take you through some verses and we'll actually talk about these verses toward the end of the message and, and talk about some things as we lead into it uh, Galatians chapter 4 verse 1 says, Now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under, governor, under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now jump with me to chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And verse uh, uh, 13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for, that, for our gathering here. And, and we thank you, what we just read there, about our liberty that we have in Christ. And as we relate, relate that to uh, uh, our liberties as we understand it from the Bible may we also see that the liberties that we enjoy as a nation came out of the scriptures and that's why we have such liberty that we have so that we might appreciate our country but Father I pray that we'll appreciate the liberty that we have in Christ that wherever we go and whatever we face and whatever the future holds can never be taken away from us in Christ's name we pray Amen <clears throat> I wanted you to see there in, in chapter 4 when it talks about that fullness of time was come that uh, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. The redemption is a term that actually just mean the, the meaning of redemption is freedom by payment of a price and redemption in here certainly the Lord Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to pay for our sins that he might redeem us from sin, from the penalty of sin, from the control of sin, from the damnation that sin would bring to us, and, and he has indeed redeemed us, and not just redeemed us, has made it possible for us through the redemption that's in Christ to become sons of God. So we have enjoyed freedom by payment of a price. And that's why when I jump from, from the re scripture reading there, the first six verses, uh, I mean, there's a lot of good verses in between there, but I jumped immediately to chapter 5 and verse 1, where it says, Stand fast, therefore in the liberty with, wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That you relate to redemption is related to liberty. And when you understand the meaning of redemption, freedom by payment of a price, therefore stand fast in that liberty. Uh, and and what, was, what we are in bondage to is under the law, and the Bible tells you that the, that the strength of sin was the law. And... and uh, no, I quoted that wrong. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is the victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us, us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The law just condemns you to be a sinner, which condemns you to damnation. 
But the Lord Jesus Christ who paid for our sins delivered us from sin and from the damnation of sin and made, made now possible for us to become sons of God and then to be, have liberty in Christ Jesus. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about that liberty. Just a little bit more about redemption. Come back to, with me to Leviticus chapter 25. Because this would be called the law of redemption. Back under the law... There are certain principles that are laid out. And then when you understand this principle of redemption back here, certainly then you can apply it to the Lord Jesus Christ. But here God's dealing with the nation of Israel. And there are certain things that, certainly it's poverty, that would bring a person into having to sell themselves into bondage, into slavery. And the worst thing <laughs> to ever happen is to be sell, sold unto a Gentile. So if we just take it in verse 47... Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 47, it says, And if a sojourner or a stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or, the, or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, after he has sold, he, after he, has sold he may be redeemed again, one of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is near of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. And then it, it explains how there's a certain uh, amount that a man sells himself into slavery until the year of Jubilee. How to calculate that difference and pay that whatever he owes to the master that he sold himself to. And if that debt is paid, he's set at liberty. He's no longer indebted to that master, no longer in bondage to serve him. But he's free now to go out as a free man and to, to live as God would have a Jew live in the age of grace or in the age of the law. So... Here is the, the law of redemption, and you see how law, uh, the law of redemption, a person is in bondage until he's redeemed. And that redemption has to do with liberty and freedom in that. Uh, you also see the, the fact that when it talks about a near kinsman, someone has to come along to, to redeem him, and it, just not anybody, but someone who's near of kin, a family member who's concerned about a member of their own family who sold himself, especially unto a Gentile. It's also true if he sold himself unto another Jewish man. But here it's un, unto a Gentile. A near kinsman can come in and redeem him. I keep seeing in that word, he may, he may, he may. You know what? He didn't have to. A near kinsman could say, hey, look, I've earned my money. He, sold, he was poor, wasted his money. I'm not bailing him out of debt. Let him serve his time. And, and so he doesn't have to. A near kinsman isn't under law responsible or, or required to bail out their, their kinsmen who sold themselves into slavery. He may. But just as it, where it says, or if he be able, the servant himself, if he can get enough money together, he can buy his own freedom. But if he certainly, if he was poor and had to sell himself, he's not the one that's going to come up with the money. So it's the kinsman who may, but not just may, he's got to be able. He can't just wish he had the money to redeem his kinsmen. He's got to have the, the financial sources to be able to do it. So he has to be first willing, and then he has to be able, and then finally he has to go pay the price. And, and then that's why he may redeem himself, or be redeemed by a kinsman. So it requires those three things, a near kinsman... One who is able, one who is willing, and then finally, if he's willing and able, he does. Redeem a person from that, 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 that bondage uh, to the person that he sold himself under. So you see what, how redemption is related to liberty. Well, we just celebrated this weekend, and still probably are celebrating to some degree, uh, our, our nation's freedom, our Independence Day, the 4th of July. And... And I, I was thinking a lot about liberty because of that. And, and it's good to remind ourselves about the liberty that our country is founded on. Because it's really, and when you study your Bible, you realize this, that our nation, our, the men who settled in our, in our land, uh, came here because of years and years of government suppression. Mostly over religion. And all of that because of some false doctrine. We, we talked last week when we were studying the final judgment of God and how it's going to follow the thousand year reign of Christ. And I said there are people who read their Bible, claim to be Christians, who are amillennialists. 
They don't believe in a literal thousand year reign of Christ. That Jesus Christ is going to return and set up his government on this earth. People who are amillennialists, that is church, and it, it, it can be Catholic and Protestant, who were amillennialists believed it was the church's job to bring God's kingdom down to this earth. And so they fought holy wars to do so, and it was always a struggle between the, the, the political government and the religious power of who's really controlling the people in a nation. And those things get combined until the point that the government always had his hand in religion. Who could read a Bible? Who couldn't? Who could translate it? What translation they could read or weren't allowed to read? And, and all that was being dictated. Man wasn't even at liberty to read his Bible on his own, which is a liberty certainly that's given to us by God. And, and yet for years and years, uh, hundreds of years, government in different ways, and in, in, in some real strict and some less strict, but in some form or another was putting suppression on men on what they could believe about God. And, and men who wanted some freedom, pilgrims and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, what's the other word? Puritans, both, uh, were, came over to this land to... to have a place where they could have this freedom to be out of the suppression of government, to open their Bible and to read it. And then as the land was filled, it's not too long that those same people that settled in our land had to fight a revolutionary war because those suppressive governments were trying to suppress the, the government on these shores. And they came here to get away from that. And at a certain point, they rallied together and fought for the freedom of the, having their own independence, and they won that freedom. When they won that freedom, those men, they knew there was a cost for liberty. They knew that there was a source behind the liberty. And they, they knew what it would take to maintain that liberty. Now this is what got me thinking because I've read several different emails about the principle of what it takes to maintain liberty. And, and I realized that, that, that all, the, all principles of liberty come out of the Bible. Those men knew that. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But, but I kept thinking to myself, what's the best title for this message? Because it's not just liberty, it's source and purpose. You are going to get that. But there is something about liberty that in your Bible has to go right alongside of liberty for liberty to exist. I mean, we just read the redemption that is in Christ. And it's only after the redemption is in Christ, and not just the redemption that's in Christ, the giving of God's Spirit, where we can become sons of God, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, that now we stand fast in that liberty. Though without Christ, there is no liberty. And without the Spirit of God, there is no liberty. And, and, and that's true nationally, as certainly personally, as, as I want to relate it to the Bible when I'm done. But I want to talk a little bit about about our nation and a, be a reminder about about our nation and its founding because the, there, there is uh, when I was up at Mike Berry's I'm, I'm thinking about these things about liberty and I know he has a Bible and it, the room they put us in uh, by the way uh, you know what I mean Mike and Patty Berry invited our family up for the 4th of July and we came back yesterday and had a real good time up north in their cabin but Mike has a Bible uh, let's see what's the name of that thing it's called the American Patriots Bible it's a New King James, by the way. Get on Mike Berry. But <laughs> I don't know if it comes in any other form. <laughs> but anyhow, it's an interesting Bible because what it does is it, it relates church history all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. You're reading the Bible and they got all these extra pieces of information. There's a particular quote I was looking for, but when I read the preface of it, I thought to myself, well, I don't really have to look too much further. I can, I can find that quote another place. Because the preface of that starts out with talking about seven principles of Judo-Christian religion. Now, I don't like re refer to Christianity as Judo-Christian, because Judo-Christian, that, that's really a way of saying Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, but that so, it, it really leaves out the dispensation of grace. And as I told you, the suppression of government uh, actually came as a result of church itself denying the scriptures, denying dispensational truth, rightly dividing even the, even the simplest division that there is a literal thousand year reign of Christ and Jesus Christ will bring his kingdom down here. We don't bring his kingdom in. He will bring it in in his time and, and bring Israel back and establish the kingdom as he said. 
And because people don't understand that, they ended up doing things that they shouldn't have done and gave government power that they should have never have. But the point is, is our forefathers came over here and whatever they believed, there's a lot of debates on certain ones, on whether they were really true Christians, were they deists or true Christians and all. But it doesn't really matter what they believe because the truth of the matter is, their writings and their, their establishment of our government established it on the principles that are based on the Bible. And that is so clear. Uh, what those men valued, what, what, what they believed as far as their salvation and other things, um, you know, you'd have to study each one separately to find out, but what they all came over here with an understanding of, of, of the Bible and some very basic principles. And there's seven principles that were found in this Bible that I, jotted, I took the time to jot them down just to kind of quickly kind of go over them with you. I don't know who wrote these principles. I'm not sure the forefathers wrote these principles. I think a, pre a preacher in putting the Bible together put the principles down, but they are the principles of our nation either way. You can identify with them. Uh, and, and each one, we won't look up the scriptures, I'll just kind of give you some ideas, some scriptures for you to think about as we think about these principles. But there's seven principles. The first is the, the dignity of human life. Now that's got to come out of the scriptures. God is the creator. And it's God who created man. And after he created man and the world fell and God had to judge the world, the first thing he told Noah when he got off the ark, he, says, he said, uh, uh, your blood of your lives will I require at your hands. And then he says, for man was created in the image of God. So we know that the very value of, of dignity of human life is a, is a principle of scripture that under the law thou shalt not kill. Uh, and then those who get away from the scriptures, the Bible, Jesus Christ rebuking the Pharisees, ye do err not knowing the scriptures. But if you know the scriptures, you know that, you're, that the very basic principle, and this country was based on that very principle of the dignity of human life. And, and, and so therefore the Declaration of Independence has in it that every, every person has certain inalienable rights. And among those rights are the rights of life, and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And, and we learn that, we know that, and, and yet in our country we don't see that happening anymore. And so one person wrote, if a person or nation do not uh, uh, grant ultimate respect and protection to both born and unborn, all the morals and values are meaningless. This is the principle of the Bible in civilized society. I don't think anybody could deny that. And yet, that is a principle that came out of the Bible, and certainly principles that our, our forefathers knew and wrote straight into that Constitution, knew that the, the liberty of life, uh, life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness is, is a right given by God, not by government. And, uh, and, but society that doesn't respect life is certainly not built on that principle. Uh, the second principle, uh, the, the, the traditional... Um, I'm not saying the word right. I had it in my head. But anyhow, the principle of, uh, uh, of, of, <laughs> I can't say the word. Uh, parents, family, one, one father, one mother, <laughs> family, uh, monogamous, that's the word I wanted. Uh, family, that, uh, that that principle, I mean you start out in the Bible, as soon as God created man and he creates Eve, he says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And that you have a father, you have a mother, they have children, and a family is made, and, and in that family, that traditional family that the Bible has established what is marriage and what is a family, that's where all the social backbone of society comes from. Where, uh, where the father and mother teach the children to, uh, in love and, and, and nurturing a child to, to respect God and to respect man. And, and they get their values from, from that family and become healthy and productive citizens in, in, in the world that we live in. And any nation, and they, they, they talked about this, that any nation that has turned away from understanding the value of a family, that nation has led to ruin. And that's just a fact of history. And, and so you realize some of the principles that are falling apart in our own nation, but yet our nation were founded on these. Those men knew those things. The national work ethic of our nation, that embedded in our nation is that honest day's pay for honest day's work. 
and uh, and and unions come along to make sure that 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 businesses weren't making slaves out of people and owning everything and then you know the, you got that pendulum swing all the time but the, the people understood when they came over here they didn't come over here for a handout they came over here to work hard and realize the very you know in scripture under the law that you can you can't you don't like our system where we work for a whole week and get paid at the end of the week you weren't allowed to do that under the law under the law at the end of the day every day you got paid for the day that you worked and uh, now we we be able to budget things and are willing to wait things slide to the end of the week or some people get paid twice a month and all of that but under the Bible there's a principle there you work hard you deserve what you get paid and the principle in that parable that when you agree to a certain amount then that was fair and right and if you don't agree then don't work for it but anyhow that honest days work is part of the fabric of America that's really brought the financial prosperity that America is M Americans have worked hard and other nations have looked to America and wonder what's the secret of their financial success hard work and uh, and so that principle is found in scripture second Th Thessalonians 310 there if, is it 310 that if a man doesn't work neither should he eat that's a principle of scripture and, and the people who founded our country realized that and it wasn't built on handouts or or the generosity of others certainly wasn't dependent on the government to make sure you, you should eat if anything was true they would realize that the generosity of Christ working in, in believers in local churches could supply the needs of, the, of those that were destitute um, but anyhow that, that's those are some of the principles our nation was based on the fourth principle is, is the right for a God-centered education a person has said, and you know this, the beginning, the fear of the, not the person, the Bible, Proverbs 1 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Um, and and, and, it's, and we're, we're to raise children, to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And as a result of that, you, you're actually, the, the Christian education is giving them the principle to be a, a productive person in society. A person has said this, how can one understand creation without first understanding the Creator? And the person answered, you can't. And yet we have an education system that's denying a creator. America's oldest universities, and, and, and when you study history, you find out that, that Harvard, Princeton, uh, Dartmouth, uh, that they all were, start, they were Christian universities. They were started by preachers, they were Bible colleges, preparing educators to go out and, and educate people based on Christianity. They were all founded by Christians and it was a Christian university. Harvard University, founded in 1636, adopted what they called the rule of precepts. And here's what it was. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well and maintain uh, and main... Uh, consider well the main end of life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ which is eternal life <laughs> now that's that's the foundation of an education and a godly education and uh, um, they had a seal that was uh, that the seal was truth for Christ and the church um, the, some of you know I, I, I've never seen I think I've seen one the New England Primer, is that what it's called? Yeah, that, that it's the textbook that kids used to learn to read from. And they learned the alphabet this way. Here's what A was. A, in Adam fall, we sin all. B, heaven to find the Bible mind. And they went through the alphabet, learning the gospel, learning the alphabet from the gospel, and vice versa. George Washington, I always knew the last part of this statement, this quote from George Washington, but I never heard the first part of it before. It's, he said, uh, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail to the exclusion of religious principles. It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. And and so a Christian education is number four. No, the fifth principle, that the, the, I changed this one around. I, like I said, I don't know who wrote it, so I have the right to change it. <laughs> but the, the principle is this. The, it's the principle of law. Uh, and, and we're not under the law, we're under grace. But there's also what under grace you understand the principle of sowing and reaping. And, and that's really the principle. Um, that obedience to God's morals laws brings blessings. You know, I, when I do a, a wedding... Uh, 
the wedding ceremony that I, that I do, it's kind of a rewritten through uh, the pastor that married Sanj and I and then through some other things. But a lot of times in a marriage you say that your marriage will be blessed. Uh, anyhow, it's like God's blessings will come upon you, like on marriage. What I've changed it to say is something to the effect that as you obey God's word, the natural consequence will be the blessings of God. And, and that's true as a nation, that there is this law of sowing and reaping. I mean, under the law, God says, if you will, then I will. But we're not under law. But we are still under the law of sowing and reaping, is that, that morals will bring blessing to a nation, and immorality will bring destruction and ruin. And that's what Proverbs 14.34 says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So people understood the moral consequences of their behavior. That's the point of principle five. Principle six is just common decency, that a decent nation is made up of decent people. And then faced with trying and difficult situations, they'll do the decent, right, and honest thing. And, and, and it takes decency. Without that in government, then, then there's going to be a, a, a decay of government. And that decency is what brings the clothing of the, the humble and all. And it's also what, you know, the, the plaque that's out there by the Statue of Liberty about bring us your, your humble masses and... and, uh, and uh, 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 you're poor and homeless and destitute and, and, and they, they come to America because in America there's going to be dis decency that's going to help those people. Uh, principle number seven is the personal accountability to God. That's our Hebrews 9.27 verse. We were quoting it last week. And that it's appointed on a man once to live and after that the judgment. And the people... Wants to die, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you're out there. Wants to die and after that the judgment. But when you think about that and the forefathers' understanding, they lived with that fear of God in mind. They knew that principle of accountability and, and, and that that accountability controlled their behavior and their decision making and all and, and realized that there's going to be a day that they're going to be accountable. And apart from salvation, they would suffer the consequence of their sin. Daniel Webster said this, Someone asked him, what is the most sobering thought that ever entered your mind? And he quickly responded, my personal accountability to God. Now you live on those type of principles, you're going to have some morality. Now none of those are the quote I was looking for, but I, I went on the internet and found, I, I realized that what I was looking for, many people have said it in many different ways. And that what I want you to see, what is associated with liberty? Now, we just talked about seven biblical principles uh, that really do come out of the Bible, that were inbred in our forefathers, and that's really what made our, great, our nation great. But there's also a warning by the forefathers, and, and Benjamin Franklin said it this way, only by a virtuous people, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become more corrupt and, and vicious, they need more masters. Hold your, oh, hopefully you're in Galatians, hold your place there, but come over with me to 1 Timothy. I say this often, I think, when, especially on a Wednesday when I'm praying for our country, and I think most people know what I'm saying when I say it, but if you want to see the verses that it's coming from, 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1 in verse 7. It says, well, let me just back all the way up to verse 3. Paul sends Timothy, and this is an important doctrine here. He says, um, ah, yeah, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than God the edifying, which is in faith, this do, uh, uh, so do. Now, it said, make sure they don't teach any other doctrine. Well, as soon as I read that, I think, other than what? Well, if you know the doctrine Paul taught, the doctrine of grace, you know what, taught, what God revealed to Paul that's for us Gentiles today in this dispensation. It's the doctrine of grace. But, uh, not only that, there, there's those at Ephesus that were teaching other things, and you'll see what they were teaching. It says in verse... Uh, um, Verse 4, neither give heed unto fables 
and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. So they're, they're turning to fables, a lot of storytelling and endless genealogies trying to probably show that they had Jewish heritage or something, not realizing that today Jew or Gentile doesn't mean anything to God. We're all on, under sin. All of us need to be saved and Jesus Christ died for us all. So, but anyhow, they're into that. And then it says, verse 5, uh, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and faith unfeigned, which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain janglings. So they're teaching other things that now he calls vain janglings. Here's what it is. Desiring to be teachers of the law, neither understanding what they say nor of whereof they affirm. So there's teachers at Ephesus, they're telling stories, they're getting the genealogies, a bunch of vain jangling, and their desires, they desire to be teachers of the law, and Paul says they have no idea what they're talking about. He says, now watch this, verse 8, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of father and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that, are, that defile themselves with mankind, by the way that's homosexuality, for, for uh, men-stealers, there's your kidnappers, for liars, for perjurous person, and if there be any other thing contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which is committed to my trust. <laughs> The gospel of grace. All those things are contrary to the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace makes you a righteous person in Christ, but it produces righteousness in your life. The point I read this verse is that if a person, if they deny God and they deny salvation, then the law is for those that are, that are involved in all of these sins. You need laws. When there is nothing but rampant sin, you need more law. And that's where our nation, we're losing our freedom as a nation because in their godlessness, there's no one telling them what morality is, so there's nothing but rampant immorality. And the more immorality there is, the more laws you need. That's what Benjamin Franklin was saying. Only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. If you're virtuous, if you have God's principles working in you, then, then you can have liberty as a nation. A nation that becomes more corrupt and vicious, they have need of masters. Uh, one another per no, John Adams wrote, said this one. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to govern any other. Wow. <laughs> they understood this Bible gets inside of a person and they can have liberty. Apart from salvation and this Bible, God's spirit inside people, there's, you can't trust them with liberty. Liberty can no more exist without virtue and independence than the body can live and move without a soul. <laughs> That's John Adams well. Noah Webster, this one, I probably won't read it good enough for you to get a, the whole sense of it, but listen close and I'll try to do my best. If citizens neglect their duty and place unprincipled men in office, the government will soon be corrupted. Laws will be made not for the public good so much as for selfish or local purposes. Corrupt or in, uh, incompetent men will be appointed to execute the law. The public revenues will be squandered on unworthy men and the rights of citizens will be violated and, and de uh, disregarded. Noah Webster wrote all that. And, and certainly, the, these guys had, they saw it. They saw you get away from the Bible. You get away from the decency taught in the Bible. You get away from the fear of God. Now, you, we know you need salvation on top of that. And that's what brings me into our, our real Bible study here. Go back to Galatians chapter 4. And it's not, not going to be deep here. It's just a basic truth that maybe you know, but maybe you need to think about just a little bit more. Now, even if people weren't saved, but they're built on a Christian principles that are taught in the Bible with that fear of God, they, their liberty can work in a nation. Uh, uh, and, and that's why our nation has been great all these years. Uh, there's been at least that element of godliness in a nation. But for true liberty, 
true liberty to work, a person needs to be saved. And when we start in Galatians here, when we start in Galatians chapter 4, let's look at those verses again and realize what our liberty is. It says, Now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governor, governors until the time appointed of the father. So understand this, a rich kid can grow up in a very rich home and he can have all kinds of, you know, access to different liberties that poor people couldn't have. I mean, he, he's an heir of, of, of all his father has, and if he's rich, that's going to be a lot of things that are going to be under his control and, and, and his ability to use and, and to do. But, but he is, even though he, when he's a child, he is under go, governors and tutors. The father will actually hire someone to do some educating of their children, and, and, the, and that child, though he is an heir, there's someone telling him what to do, when to do it, when to eat, what to eat, when to go to bed, when to do his studies, when he can have free time. So he can be heir of everything, but he's still under go governors and tutors until the time appointed of a father. When the father thinks his son has reached a place of maturity, they remove all the governors. Now, now, now the child should be educated to the point that they're going to make proper, right decisions because they've been taught and educated correctly. So it says in verse 3, even so we, we're, chil we're children, we're, we're in bondage under the elements of the law. Back when God was dealing with the nation of Israel, they, every, they had to figure out what day it was, they had to figure out what they could eat, they had to figure out what kind of clothes they had, could wear, they had to figure out what plants they could plant in, in the garden. They had to figure out what animals they were allowed to eat. I mean, they, the law regulated their whole life. They didn't have to, they didn't make decisions. They had to find out what the law demanded of them. And so, uh, the Jews were under the law, were under the elements of the world. It says in verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Jesus Christ comes in as the kinsman redeemer. To those who are under the law. Now everybody under the law is under the curse of the law. You can read that in the book of Galatians. Because no one's ever fulfilled the law. They've broken the law. So Jesus Christ as the kinsman redeemer comes into the world. And the world's under the penalty of sin. The law demands excellence, perfection. And everybody's failed and there's a consequence for that. And Jesus Christ comes in as a kinsman. He took on human flesh. He took on the seed of David, the seed of Abraham, to come to the nation of Israel. But he took on the human flesh for all of humanity as well. So he comes as a kinsman redeemer. He has not broken the law. So not only is he a kinsman redeemer, he is able to pay our debt of sin. And because he's not just man, if he was just man, he could only die for one person, right? But he's the God, creator of man, the God-man, who could die for all of his creation. And Jesus Christ became the kinsman redeemer, was able to make a payment that would satisfy the broken law that sold every one of us under the debt of sin and the penalty of sin. He was able and he did it. The Bible says he gave himself for our sins. That's Galatians 1.5 there, 1.4. That he gave himself for us. The Lord Jesus Christ, the kinsman redeemer, was willing was able, and he did it. And then he redeemed us that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. See, it didn't end there. He paid the debt of sin, so we're delivered from the slave market of sin. We're redeemed from the penalty of our sins. We're, we're free from sin. But when it says that we might receive the adoption of sons, and then verse 6, And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, whereby, uh, 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 no, the spirit of your Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God's spirit comes into your, with your spirit, and cries along with your spirit that God is your Father. And he is. You, we're all the children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But you're not just liberated from sin to go back and live in sin. God liberated you from sin, put his spirit in you, so that you could be a mature adult son. Freedom from sin does not mean freedom to sin. God's spirit was given to us, and that Holy Spirit of God is our seal unto the day of redemption. 
We're never going to go back to the slave market of sin. God's Spirit is, seals us into the day of redemption. But God's Spirit also is the Spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And in that Spirit is the liberty not to sin. And you need to have that understanding. Just as we talked about a nation that doesn't have uh, the virtue and morals of Christian principles, therefore they have no right to liberty, you as a believer need to understand that your liberation, that your redemption, that God has not just redeemed you and left you there, He put His Spirit in you so He can treat you as an adult son, because it is an adult son that's been, been saved by the grace of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit, is empowered not to go back and live in sin, but to live from, a, apart from sin. Amen. And not just live apart from sin. Look back at, now look at chapter 5. Our liberty has been empowered. Without the empowerment, without the redemption and the Holy Spirit, liberty wouldn't work in us. But since God has saved us, delivered us from sin, and put his Holy Spirit in us, chapter 5 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again in a yoke of bondage. Well, the law didn't give you any power over sin, but God's Spirit gives you power over sin. Understanding who you are gives you power over sin. So stand fast in the liberty. Don't let those people put you back under the law. Stand in grace, but understand what grace is. Grace is not a license to sin. Now, grace covers all the sin. You know, if you give someone liberty, you risk a chance they'll, they'll uh, abuse it. But that's what liberty does. And in that abuse, you, you learn to appreciate the liberty and to live in, in the, prop, the proper way in liberty. So God, in dealing with us, he knows there's people that's going to take the grace of God and, and, and abuse that. But even in that abuse... When you understand that sin destroys, but also you understand that it doesn't damn you anymore. That you begin to understand the grace of God and the power of the Christian life and why you ought to leave sin and serve God. There, there's, there's power in failure. Because grace picks you back up and, and you learn in your failures, why would I go back again to those things? That's what Romans 6 says. Why, why go to those, go back that you were the servant of sin, but you're now free from sin. The point is, is Galatians 5, look at verse 13 again. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. We are liberated. We're under grace. We're not under law. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So, you've been called unto liberty, but don't you, now how are you going to use that liberty? It says, don't use liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Now, some have. Hopefully, they learn not to because it just brings ruin to their life. But rather, it says, to use liberty to, by love, serve one another. Well, wait a minute. By love, serve one another? Verse four, 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. See, God puts his spirit within you so that you have the power to serve the Lord. It's Romans chapter 8 that tells you that, that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And, and that Christ... I'm going to quote it wrong. That the righteousness... Oh, no, wait, I'll start again. For the law, what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. God's given us the Spirit so that, he could, so that we could have liberty. Liberty to do what? To live in sin? No. For the first time, you're liberated, so liberated from sin that you don't have to, you're, you're not a servant to sin. You don't have to live in sin. You don't have to practice sin. You are now liberated to love for the first time ever. You're now liberated to serve God for the first time. And that liberty used property, properly by love will fulfill the law. To love your neighbor as yourself. So I, I say that to you because we talk about liberty. But there's something that always goes hand in hand with liberty. In the governmental ways or in society, it's virtue. In, in the Christian walk, it's the grace of the Spirit of God in our life 
and understanding that God saved us and liberated us so that for the first time we can live apart from sin, we can actually serve God, and we can love our neighbor as, our, as ourself, but also we could do the other part of that law, we can love God and not serve sin. Use your liberty properly. What goes hand in hand with the liberty is the power to live the Christian life, not the power to revert back to what brought you into slavery. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that each person understands the redemption that's in Christ, the very basic principle, that we couldn't save ourselves, that Jesus Christ died and he paid for our sins, rose again to give us eternal life, and so we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. But Father, I pray we'd also understand that we're not under the law because we live in the dispensation of grace. The moment we trust Christ, we're empowered by your Holy Spirit. And by your word and your spirit in our life, we are liberated now to live and serve you when we had no power to do it before. And I pray that we live in that liberty and it be manifested in ministry to others. And we thank you for the opportunity we thank you for the understanding of this. We pray that we'll never let another man bring us back into bondage. But Father, we pray we don't let the flesh bring us into bondage either. And we pray this in Christ our Savior's name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom, for that thought-provoking message. This Stand and sing the little chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, as we're dismissed. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. You are dismissed.